So uh, this will be pretty informal, I guess. I'll just like be bouncing back and forth with you guys. But uh, in this, I guess, mini lecture, I'll just be covering two things, which is one, basic feed-forward neural network structure and how they work, and second off, um, how they learn, which is in this case just simple back propagation. Right. Um, uh, um, and, and then back prop. Is that even visible? No. Okay. Um, so. I'm going to set up an example network here, and for people that know how like networks are structured, it's going to seem very small, but that's fine because we don't want to show up as too big of an example, because we're actually going to do the back propagation for this one, at least on like on a scale of like variables. So for those that are unfamiliar with like neural network structure, I call these neurons. I think most people call them neurons, and these are just like edges. And in essence, they are all values. These are all variables, and they can represent as values. And often in like neural networks, when you save them, it's just a list of weights. And um, in some cases, biases, if you guys know about biases, but I'm not going to go into that for, for this. So I'm going to write some notation here that I'm going to carry on throughout the whole lecture. And I'm just hopefully it makes sense. Let me know if it does. So this neuron or the value of the activation for this neuron is going to be a super O sub L. It's going to be a I L minus 1, a I L minus 2. And then we have the weights here as well. The So this is our example network that I'm going to be using for I guess, the rest of the lecture. So let's just talk about, in general, how this would work in this sense. I'm going to start with the feed forward, and I'll cover the back propagation later. So um, I'm going to use the example of the MNIST, like I said, I believe MNIST? That's the right one, right? Yeah, yeah. MNIST. MNIST, OK. <laughs> I'm going to call it either, but it's yeah. MNIST. OK, MNIST. It's shorter. Okay. <laughs> so uh, you guys know it's a collection of basically just Handwritten digits. What's the pixel? 28 by 28. 28, 28, 28, 28. 28. So it's going to be just so basically a bunch of boxes with handwritten digits in them. And they can be divided into just like 28 by 28 little grids. And each, like the light of each grid is basically just like pixel value, essentially. So it's like on the place where the two is actually written, you'll have like a higher value, I think between 0 and 1, I believe. Right? And the darker place where there's no text or scribbles or whatever is going to be 0. Now, this data turned into a line of just values is going to be the inputs for our neural network. Obviously, the, for the MNIST uh, network that you use to like, actually classify these digits into like, oh, this is a 1, this is a 2, this is a 3, you would have 28 times 28 input neurons. Because every single pixel would need to go into a neuron. Like I said, a neuron is just simply a value, right? So um, this is a smaller network obviously, but you can think of these as these ones are the initial values that we actually put into the network. Everything after that is taken care of by the network itself. Um, to calculate the uh, value of the next activation for the neuron in the next layer, these are layers by the way, uh, the back layer, next layer, and the last layer. That's why I put L, by the way, last layer. That's what it denotes. So say we have some value in here and some value in here. Uh, the weights connecting this neuron to the next one are is the factor by which we multiply the value inside this neuron. Okay, so called the activation of this neuron was just like give that a one and then give this like a one half or something like that, right? And we'll give this a value of like I'll just do one again and then one half. Although um, I will say these uh, values, if you're using a sigmoid function, which I'll explain later, are going to be between 0 and 1. And if you use other activation functions, like ReLU or Leaky ReLU, I believe they can actually go. You can use any activation function you like. Yeah, as long as I think it's like. Yeah. But I, for the purpose of this, I'll stick to sigma just cause, because the 0 and 1 like range makes sense for this actually. However, the weights can take on quite a large range. Uh, I believe it depends like. 
how how widely you initialize them because at the beginning this network is going to have random weights and um, is only determined the final value is determined by those random weights and the input we give it. So to calculate the value of the next neuron, you take these two numbers and multiply them together, and then you sum that with these two numbers multiplied together. Do one plus one fourth, this is five fourths, right? And then I'm gonna call this Z. And that is going to be the raw activation of the neuron. However, you see that these, because we're dealing with just a sigmoid function here, these are gonna be between zero and one. And we will limit that to be between zero and one. So we pump that through the sigmoid function, which is, that's right. Sigmoid of x equals one over one, getting this right? Yeah, one plus e to the negative x. So you just pump this uh, value into that x, and what you'll get is a value between 0 and 1, because the sigmoid function looks something like this, with a horizontal asymptote. Yeah, horizontal. Y equals 1, so it never reaches 1, and another horizontal asymptote at y equals 0, so it never reaches 0. Uh, 0, 1 half, 1. So that's the sigmoid function, uh, essentially, and say we're at like, Five fourths, right? So we're a little bit past like one here. It would be above one half. Uh, can I yeah. speak up a little? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, get my camera. So yeah. Close. So uh, just to like clarify something before before as to why we have an activation function, especially for somebody who's not at, like in an ML blue background, uh, what we get after we multiply the the input values by the weights is just a number that's kind of like how active should this be? However, like if we look at like the parallel in the brain, nodes either fire or they don't. So this kind of approximates that by making it so that no matter how many uh, inputs there are, it either fires or it doesn't, sort of. Yeah. So also, it, it kind of turns it into something a little more similar to what's happening in the brain, mm -hmm. though at a very rough analogy. And you're talking like, about the sigmoid function yeah, specifically. Yeah. The reason for an activation function. Well, not all activation functions. Yeah. yeah. That's true. Well, generally they look, but that's yeah. that is the inspiration of the sigmoid function, despite the fact that actually non-sigmoidal ones work better, and then that, that analogy breaks down. <laughs> but even so, it's sort of the mm -hmm. well. Another, I guess we, I should probably not interrupt for too long. That's okay. Wait, I have a question that's yeah. unrelated. How come not all the input neurons are connected to the second input and the second layer? Oh. Usually, I mean, they, they can be. I'm just doing this for simplicity. It would just create more connections. What you could consider this as is that they are, it's just zeros. So we're yeah. going to ignore them. That's so another they're always connected. So in a Usually in yeah. like dense networks, everything's connected everything's between connected. Two, two like One, two, three, four to there, and then like one, two, and then like one, two, and then. Yeah, and then so Charles gave like the whole presentation on sparse coding. So that's where you would have a lot of connections that are just, they're connected, but they're zero. So they're not. Yeah. Oh, like I said, this is not supposed to do anything. This is like the stupidest network you'd possibly, I don't know, even know what this could possibly do. But it was just for simplicity. Um, and also I wanted to make it like symmetrical. So you can, s I will show later how one calculation or two can be applied throughout the whole network. That's why I designed it like this. Um, another thing for the sigmoid function, actually, that you reminded me of, is so that it doesn't blow up in the end. Because these are all going to be like multiplications by like some number, right? So if you flip the negatives enough, you have multiply by four or five enough times, you just get like a thousand at the end. That doesn't really mean much. Uh, sigmoid helps it actually, I believe someone said in the channel, like helps it actually, you can get a probabilistic result instead of like some just random comparison. Like if you keep using sigmoid throughout the whole thing or through certain parts of it, you can actually have like, I am 99% confident instead of I am 99 confident and who knows what that means, right? So anyway, uh, continuing on, where am I? A small tangent that will be useful later is just general like multivariable notation. You're all used to seeing like f of x, which means that this is a function that has a variable within it that is x. This is a function that has variables both x and y. And in multivariable calculus, at least the calculus class I took before, like you can think of like f of x as like on a 2D grid, the y values are influenced by like the x values, so you get something like this. But of, if you have f of x comma y, you obviously can't have y equals f of x comma y, you can just simplify that into like a single y. 
So you introduce a new variable or a new axis called z, and then you have a three-dimensional grid in which you can plot some three-dimensional function where the z value is now influenced by both the x and y. So this is three dimensionals. And then this is the z-axis and the x and the y. Of course, not three is not limited to three dimensions. Yeah. It goes up to however many you like. Exactly. These are the only like visualizable. Actually, what tens you, you taught me? What is the, the visualizer for the oh. dimensions? Well, that's a little different. That, that works better for points. Oh, OK. okay. Kind of that kind of stuff. But yeah, he's completely right. This can be fx, y, z, a, b, c, d, alpha, gamma, whatever, right? It can go up to as many as you want. And actually, I'm about to cover that because this right here, as you can see, it is, in essence, for propagating forward, multiplication and addition, right? And so we can actually write or consider our network a big function. It's in essence, that's what it is, this big function with multivariable input and, in this case, a single output, which is easier for visualization than thinking purposes. But in a lot of cases, like MNIST, it will be multivariable like output as well, or vector output. That's another way of thinking about it, right? Because the values are technically independent of each other and can be considered separately. Um, another thing that is important to introduce in just terms like networks in general is the idea of a cost function, OK? And I know you're saying it like uh, this is like loosely um, inspiration for like the sigma function is loosely based on the brain's activation. This is where we kind of stray away from that because there is no cost function in the brain. But uh, what a cost function is is essentially if I go back over here, each of these uh, pictures is tagged with a desired output essentially. For MNIST, we have uh, ten possible classical digits zero through nine and. We were throwing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And that would be zero, that would be nine. If a two is, can you guys see that? Say we feed this network a two, right? We want it to actually give us some like reasonable output. We want to be able to say, hey, looking at the output of this network, I can tell that this network thinks that this digit is a two. So what how we denote that, I guess, in just this general like line of neurons, this represents the last layer of like a MNIST uh, network. The neuron corresponding to two would be fully activated, while the others would not be activated. And what this is telling us is, hey, network, when I give you this, you should be spitting this out. Now, like I mentioned earlier, these weights are initially randomly generated. So there is no way that the initial network don't start with the whole. <laughs> there is no way that the initial network, the whole network, can um, perform the task just straight out, of the, straight out of the bat, essentially. It will give you a result that looks more like. Yeah. So if I consider like a hole shaded in as one and then like leaving it empty as like zero, you get something like this. Something like that. That's useless. That's not a number whatsoever. We cannot interpret that information. So the cost function is essentially the difference between these two outputs. It's telling us how bad this network perform. The higher the cost, the worse the network. And then this uh, takes it to like just the general premise of back propagation. Is that if we get our cost function nearing zero, that for all training examples. That means that this network can accurately classify the digits we give it. Because if the cost is super high, it did a bad, right? If the cost is super low, that means it classified the digit correctly. If it can classify the digits correctly, i.e. have a low cost for all the digits that we give it, we know the network is trained. So I'm going to introduce like this variable, or I'm just going to do a circle. It's going to be y hat. This is the what we want it to predict. This is what it actually predicts. So just keep that in mind that this is what the network gives us. This is what we want the network to give us. Give us. And uh, for the purposes of this demonstration, I'll be doing a um, difference of squares. Wait, square difference? Mm, different squares. Isn't that weird, though? Because like the difference squared, not difference of squares. The square difference. I think that's square difference. Yeah. yeah. Square difference cost function, which essentially just means that. Yeah, I don't know, but um, is a squared difference 
uh, cost function, which essentially says the cost of the network is just determined by taking uh, the activations of the last layer, difference with y hat, which is what we wanted to give, and then squaring it. Obviously, uh, if you have a network with multiple outputs, this is the vector part I was talking about, you can just literally just treat these as vectors. And then you will get a vectorized output of like some number, some number, some number, some number. And then um, that will be, I guess, just uh, the vector form of your cost function, or the cost, that will be the cost right there. Um, now, I'm actually not fully sure if they sum this to give you a full value or if the it's sum average. It's, it's, a, it's average mean okay. squared error. Is the mean squared error. All right. So they, they would take this vector and collapse it into a scalar, and then that would just be average. Correct. Yeah. So that's how you just get this nice golden value here, C, which from here on out will mean the cost of the network. So two things I want to combine now before we get into the calculus is the idea that a network is a multivariable function. And we can calculate the cost of that multivariable function, and we want to minimize the cost. So what does backpropagation turn into? A minimization problem. You have um, this, uh, okay, I hope I don't lose you guys on like the notation here, because there's a lot of index chasing in this. But you, you can write, like just like I wrote f of x and f of x comma y, you can write this, network as a function of, and then, oh god, just gotta copy this down, a minus two from one through four, comma, wait, one, one through four, a of l minus one, one, two, These are the variables that influence the cost. And uh, you want to say, oh, sorry. Um, what do you separate them by a layer? Separate them, what do you mean separate them by layer Y? You have L minus two, L minus one, L minus, but you have like I through IB. Oh, okay, let me explain that notation actually. I don't think I did it very well. This is just to differentiate within a layer. The superscript is differentiate within a layer because we're going one through four. And the subscript is to def differentiate between layers. Just to make sure, a subscript yeah. is the one that's lower and subscripts mm -hmm. go higher. Uh, yeah. Look at the one that's uh, right, right there. there. Needs an I. Oh yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Just to make sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, also, you you were gonna say something. Oh, no. Okay. Okay. Awesome. But so it looks like your your inputs, the cost function, are separated by a layer. Correct. Oh no no sorry. This is just literally saying this is. So, the place in the first layer, right? Right there, that like you're writing out. So, oh, sorry, let me just answer this. So, like, basically, I'm just—I just didn't want to write out this four times. So, I'm just saying this is just the comma separated, oh. comma separation. It's not like those mel meld into one input whatsoever. This is straight up just a l minus a sub l minus two super one a sub l minus two super two comma 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 over and over. I'm just not writing that. So basically, you input oh, sure. okay. you input everything you have. In yeah. No, you might notice that the activations are determined by the weights. So we can actually simplify this to just basically be a cost function that is determined by some list vector of weights. Okay? Let me just make sure this right. Well, you also need the initial activations because those are provided as inputs. Yeah, very true. However, no, I, that's or, kind of part of the data. Never mind. Yeah, yeah you're, you're right. Technically, if we're going the pure mathematical, those initial inputs would be part of this function. But for terms of backpropagation, we're not going to count them because the network has no control over it, if that makes sense. We have control over what we give the network, right? But the whole point I'm trying to get at is here. This is a cost function that is represented by the network. Minimizing this trains the network. So how do we minimize this function? Wait, I have a question. Doesn't, yeah. do, don't we need a log function for the cost function? A log, can you explain yeah. that? Like, um, in my notes, I wrote like, y log uh, top hat plus one minus y. Wow. Like, there's like a whole log equation. Is for there, does anyone function. know what that's talking about? That's not uh, complicated. We yeah. 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 the different cost function. So there's different mm -hmm. variations on some of these oh, functions, okay. and um, one that's used a lot is called log loss or mm -hmm. cross entropy. Yeah. Is another name for it. 
It's called logistic regression cost function from yeah. Andrew and G. Yeah. You guys know. So, um, mm -hmm. okay, another way to like just briefly summarize some of the stuff that you've said, uh, correct me if I make any mistakes when saying this, is uh, essentially we're treating the network itself as one big function that takes in some number of inputs, gives some number of outputs, and we just kind of chain the cost function. We kind of just combine them together, smush them into one function, where given some inputs, it provides some the cost of like how good did it do. But instead of considering the inputs to that function as what we actually give it as input, like the image, we instead consider the weights of the network as the inputs to the cost function. And we assume that uh, the, image, the image and the target, that's all fixed. So it's more along the lines of cost of the weights that we put into, the cost of running the network with uh, some uh, weights and some inputs uh, with respect to some given uh, target. Yeah. And then that's or the function that we're trying to optimize for. And uh, one thing I will note, just for anyone that might be a little lost, because um, it's almost like not knowing much might help you in this, because I'm skipping over a bit of things. But you brought up a good point. This is all relevant to one single training example. I will explain later how that can be used to do different types of gradient descent, stochastic versus just like all data, and why some are more computationally uh, intensive than others. But for now, just know that this is all straight up just based on those two right here. We're trying to optimize this network for that two and that two alone. Um, obviously, that's not optimal, because then the network is going to be um, incentivized to just classify whatever it sees as a two. We are going to give it different inputs, and it is just through training it on all of those examples over and over again that you get a network that operates on all of the, of the examples you want it to operate on, not just like the number two. So let me just check this out real quick. Okay, that covers it for just basically the setup before the calculus. Um, this is what we're going to try to optimize. Remember, the goal is just simply to minimize this. Minimize. That's the whole goal of this. And if you understand what this is, in the sense that it's just basically the weights of the function, weights of the network as a function, and now how do we minimize this becomes a problem. So I know that was a lot. Any questions on that at all? Is optimization going to be an NP hard problem? Like, uh, in terms of like math, like, are we can we get this to pure zero over and over? So like, I know that you can initialize the neural network multiple times in different mm -hmm. different weights and yeah. different solutions. You can find different local minimas. Yeah. So, so the absolute minima, I th think finding that would be NP hard or just. Yeah, damn hard, I guess. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 But yeah, hard. computer science just too difficult. <laughs> finding the local minima, however, is possible because like we we do it. Like finding the local minima of this cost function is what a train network is. So it is doable. Fine, man, it's doable. I mean, um, you have to know the entire search space to know if you're at the absolute minimum. And the search space is like depending on your problems. Yeah. <laughs> Damn hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, All right. Strictly, like, if you really want to tell, like, the pretty much the only way you can know is either with some mathematical derivations showing the absolute best, or just try a really fine grid search of the entire possible space. That would yeah. take a while. <laughs> Especially since, like, these weights, if you bound the weights, and then you have a really small network, maybe you won't in realistic problems. So that covers that. Um, I'm going to move to this board right now, and I might take a ball. <laughs> so if you want to uh, pivot that camera. Uh, we're going to go into the calculus now. So, um, Wait, Ruben, what does so. it mean by um, the gradient oh descent God. while finding the global optimum? What? I'm going to go over what gradient descent is. One second. Ask that question again once I get over it. I think it's a good idea to talk about gradient descent, not in the context of networks, but like just mathematically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I got you. Okay, perfect. So, yeah, why don't we start off with that? I'm going to introduce the concept of gradient descent, or just the concept of gradient in general, and also the concept of a partial derivative. Uh, yeah, so count three, uh, <laughs> say we want to minimize, um, actually no, skip minimization for a second. Let's just talk about gradients. Here's a function. Can someone tell me if they can see this on the screen? Over there, is that? Oh, sorry. I don't know if it's at all. Yeah, sorry, you can zoom in. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right, Good. awesome. So, and everyone else can see that just with their eyes, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I'm gonna just 
give a function that's very simple. Okay, here's our function, right? And if you were to graph this, it looks like some kind of like an open bullet. Oh, not that. Looks kind of like an open bullet like this. Um, elliptic paraboloid for those who like quadrate surfaces. I don't know who does though. Um, so yeah, this is what it would look like. Yeah, you can look that up. If you want to graph it, it would look something like this. Three dimensional graph. Yeah. With that being like an open space. Yeah, this would do it. Yeah. Okay. So um, just thinking conceptually, say you're like trapped inside that like bullet, and you want to make it as hard as possible to climb out of it. Uh, you want to make it as hard as possible to climb out of this for some reason, right? You want to find the steepest way up, okay? So how do we find that steepest way up? We find the gradient of this function, which essentially tells you at a point which direction do you have to go to make it the hardest for you to go up, essentially. It's going to show you the steepest path of ascent. So... Are you familiar with what a gradient is? Yeah. Can you pause for a second? Yeah, of course. A gradient is just derivative. Why don't you start with a one-dimensional <laughs> example? Because it's one-dimensional. One that's yeah. more, yeah, that's I think more one, easy to... A one-dimensional example is good because anybody, most people are familiar with derivatives once uh -huh. they get to this, but generalizing to gradients is not that the hard. The reason I wanted to do this is because I need to introduce partial derivatives at the same time. That's fair. You can't take partials of... Maybe you can. I don't know. But <laughs> you can kind of just like fumble your way through it, and it looks about right even if you don't know the exact details. I'll, I'll do this. Anyway, Let me know yeah. if it's still confusing, and then I definitely will go into a one-dimensional. Or maybe you can explain it, because if I can help you. Yeah, that'd be great. So um, I'm sure you can. here is the little partial derivative symbol. Get ready to see it a lot. It's a del, I believe. OK. So essentially, if we rewrite this function right here as um, z, because remember, 2e space, uh, z becomes the function that we're uh, going to look for, not y, equals 5x squared plus 2y squared. Partial derivative, in my mind, and someone else can offer an alternate explanation if this doesn't work for them, is when you take the derivative of a function, of a certain, a multivariable function, take the derivative of a multivariable function with respect to only one variable, and you just pretend that all the other variables are locked as constants. That's actually, while it seems complicated, makes cal calculating the derivative super easy. You essentially just say, hey, if I'm taking the partial derivative of this function with respect to x, I can ignore y almost completely. It's a constant to me. I can rewrite this as the number 5, and it won't change the derivative. Uh, it, bas it basically won't. If you, a bad example, sorry. It might. It Really? Because what if you result x, y, x, take the partial derivative with respect to x, you get y instead of 5. In your specific example, you can just replace that yeah. with 5. Yeah. In this example, like I could literally replace this with a 5, and it wouldn't affect it whatsoever. I'll show you how. If I take the partial derivative with respect to x of this function, it's pretty simple, actually. It's just. Notice how I can completely ignore that. Usually, you know, if you're taking the normal derivative, you get like some all dy over dx, something like that, and you keep the y in there. But I don't want to enter like dpq land, so we're going to just kick it out. This is the partial derivative of z with respect to x. So you pretend y is a constant, and then that evaluates to zero when you take the derivative of it. Right? Yeah, essentially. And what's the nice thing about it is like this say at a certain point, like right here on this plane, um, that is a multivariable function of x and y. If I was to take the partial derivative with respect to x and then turn that into a line, what I would get is a line parallel to the x-axis that is tangent to the plane at that point. Notice how it does not travel along the y-axis whatsoever. It's locked to that point on the x-axis. It does not mess because what you can basically do is turn this 3D shape into a two-dimensional visualization. You're basically, if you are the point traveling along this line, you don't see the y-axis. You see the x and the z, and you're like, okay, at this point, the slope is this. At this point, the slope is this. Obviously, there's a whole other dimension to it. Instead of like, I'm looking at the x, I go up, down, whatever, right, on this 3D surface. I don't care what's going on to the left or right of me. That's the, that's the purpose of a partial derivative. What's really helpful is it helps us, like, 
this is like a thousand plus for an MNIST variable function. If you were to take like the actual derivative of that, I don't even know if it would be helpful, but if you could find it. Um, taking it one by one lets you take like find an actual usable value by locking all the other variables in place. So you like basically, it's, it's hard to visual and like visualize in like high dimensional space, but you'd like lock one component of the vector and just like look how you how changing that would affect the cost function. Okay, I see. Yeah. So um, continuing with this, finding the gradient of this, um, we'll also take the partial derivative of z with respect to y. Now notice in this case, because it's respect to y, I completely ignore x. And I get these two numbers right here, or, yeah, functions, and I can put it into a nice little vector here. And now if I have a point, say one comma one, plug this into here, I will get. Now what is this? It is the gradient. It's the gradient of that function at this point. Essentially, if you face this direction when you're at one comma one, that line or that path you're gonna travel on is the steepest possible ascent. Okay, so how is this helpful for us? Remember that this is an optimization problem, right? And while you can optimize by stumbling around randomly, wouldn't it be nice to take the most efficient path downwards? What this gradient helps us find is the most efficient path downwards. The actual function we're going to use to um, update the weights would be like this. Weight post is equal to weight pre-update minus some learning rate times the gradient of the cost function. And notice that these are all vectors, except for that it's a scalar. Essentially what this is saying is the all the weights post-update is going to be equal to all the weights pre-update minus some learning rate, which I just wanted to include there for people that know what learning rate is. Um, but if you don't know what that is, you can kind of ignore it. It's a scalar, so it won't modify anything but like the ratio of the values of the vector. Um, you're going to take, like, say for example, like the very first weight in the function, whatever it is in this vector, um, the f that weight, I can do. Oh, yeah, learning rate times. Does that line right here make sense? Can you even read that? Is it? Any question? I, I would actually really appreciate a question if some part of that is confusing. Um, just to clarify, this yeah. is like a different time steps, you know? Because like you've used a superscript and a subscript, and you know, there's also like now a time dimension, which yes. is Again, unfortunate notationally because- One training example, singular training example. Yeah, I'm just saying like this is your, your new weight is your old weight. Oh, yeah, weight. sorry, I should do post double subscript. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. why I said it's, it's hard because you're, yeah, yeah. you're ran out of- My bad, <laughs> yeah, so like, I don't even know what I can do after that. Like up here maybe? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so, so, the updated weight post is just the pre-weight minus, because remember, gradient is the steepest way up, we want to go the steepest way down, because we're not trying to make this the shittiest network. Shittiest <laughs> network possible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my worst network possible, we're trying to make the best network, we're trying to minimize the cost, right? So we want to go down, which is why we subtract um, the gradient from that pre-value, all right? So if this line makes sense, then you'll notice that we have this value. We set this value. How do we find this? Which is the partial derivative of the cost function with respect to that single weight. And that single weight, this one right here, this is the weight I'm going to calculate the update for. Not with numbers, but with variables. That way right there. So that's the weight in question, right? So now you're going to be writing a lot for this next part. <laughs> so, so. Any, any question? Oh, that way's down, right? When you say down. What do you mean? Like, it just, like, just like, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, if I'm looking up at the hill this way, there's a gradient. The gradient's telling me to go this way, but like the hardest path up. I want to flip around and look at the, you know, the easiest path down. And that's just like general, like 
vectors, if you um, take the vector and then just like make it negative, you will go the opposite direction. And just like that, this is a very high dimensional vector and we just go the opposite direction. I think it's, uh, it would be good to visualize a one dimensional example. So you could just like draw a yeah. graph and then show. Oh, just for general gradient. Yeah, yeah, hold on. I can do that. Um, yeah. So let's do like this. Some graph. Actually, I can introduce the concept of like max a local versus like. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say our initial. So what are your axes here? Do you want to label your axes? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, my axes. My bad. Uh, let me know if anything else is up. Well, so what does one x represent in this, in this graph? Y and x. Uh, I don't know if we can liken this to a network. Oh, let's just call y the cost. Right, so y would be the cost and x would be some variable, some right? Variable. Yeah. yeah, one of your parameters. So let's say the network is initialized right here. OK? We want to look this up here. This way would be the steepest way up. So we flip that and look for the way down. And we move down, right? By some scalar learning rate. Like I said, if that's super high, we jump down to like here. If it's small, we kind of take a baby step. Right? And then just through that, doing that process over and over and over again, we will reach some local minima. Local, I'm emphasizing that, because notice that this is lower. There is no possible way with this method of like back propagation and training that we can find this. We do not know this exists. For all intents and purposes, it does not exist. Are you upstep size? We can still blade switch. Oh, <laughs> valid. Yeah, if I set this to like 20, we'll just like do a big leap over here. But like, essentially, what I'm saying is this is where randomizing like the network weights kind of does play into like, you know, how the network could optimize itself. Say we started here, we would end up right here at the, you know, global minima, but on like this much of a high dimensional space, that's not very likely to occur. Which is why I, I honestly think that the randomization of a network, unless it is like incredibly varied, you will stumble into a very similar local minima. Maybe not in the exact same space, because again, this is a huge like high dimensional space. But I do think the performance will be similar. Anything against that? Well, there's also the uh, idea that you can walk around the mountain. Like you imagine that that mm. peak right there is kind of like a mountain, and you can go around it. Yeah, that's why which is a three D visualization. Isn't that what like the thing that the neural nets are really good at? That's the whole purpose of. Well, that's the thing. You would never climb the mountain, would you? Yeah. Um, Say. Well, I think what he's saying is, if you're thinking in three dimensions, you might be able to just go around the mountain and mm -hmm. arrive at a, at the global minima. But say at the top of the mountain, right? There's like a dip that goes to zero. Right. You wouldn't reach that. Right. Unless there's a fourth dimension. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right here. Yeah. Yeah. That's what the I mean, just having the thousands of dimensions yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the problem, like, you can expand the dimensions, but that does not mean you're going to reach the global minimum. Yeah. yeah. You so still would need to have knowledge of the entire mm -hmm. like landscape in order to know if it's the global minimum. Yeah. I hope this like this is your empty hard thing, right? Like, I hope this clarifies it a bit more. What I was saying, like, it's like, oh, sure, here it could happen because we can randomize here, and I'll stumble into it for this percentage, right? But like. The global minima is like a point on this basically infinite high dimensional space. Chances that we stumble into any space around it is very low. All right. Um, well, I'm just trying to get at like, is is there, is it guaranteed by like some theory that having higher high dimensions will allow you to step around mountains? Like, like Good question. Like, I don't have the answer to it. Okay. There's a paper called "The Blessing of Dimensionality" that you should read. Uh, it's not that they're guaranteed, but it helps one. Because I first read the curse of dimensionality. Yeah, it's. <laughs> no, <laughs> what is it? What is it? <laughs> okay. So, so all these paper titles are good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Um. All right. Now we can. Oh, Jesus Christ, guys! <laughs> now we can get into actual back propagation. I am going to define the gradient of the cost function as the vector space in which we have, oh wait, shoot, um, I got this, we're back. And then we have uh, a, a, I mean, again, these aren't groups, sorry if it, my notation is incredibly confusing. These are just me not wanting to write out every single iteration of these. Have you ever seen an emoji at this table? 
<laughs> so essentially what this is saying is the gradient the gradient is composed of the gradient just like here notice how this vector can be written as um, z x z y for every single uh, variable we have in this multivariable function the gradient vector, the direction in which the steepest ascent is, is simply going to be the vector in which every single dimension is represented by its um, partial derivative with respect to the cost, in this case, because the cost is the left side variable. Um, z uh, del z over del x, del z over del y. Now, instead of f of x comma y, we have c of that. I'm not writing it again, sorry. Um, and then we can represent that as this vector in which every single one of these terms will be inserted into the bottom of, yeah, bottom of this like little uh, derivative function. So does that make at least a little bit of sense as to what this means right here? I'm just saying that the gradient is going to be just like, actually, because um, remember, like I said, we're actually going to just consider the weights, but it's just going to be a vector of the derivative partial of cost with respect to each of those weights. And the reason that is useful is because it will tell us how to adjust every single one of those weights to make the network's cost increase in the fastest way possible. Just flip that on its head and we get the vector to apply to our network to decrease the cost in the most efficient way possible. What does the inverted triangle mean? Gradient. Okay. That's just a gradient notation. Okay. And so we're taking uh, the the gradient of the c is the derivative of a c with respect to every single weight. Every single weight in a vector, though, not so some, not average. And then, okay. Yeah. Uh, let me okay. write it in a yeah. bit more. It would be like del c over del w i l del c over del w i i l dot 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 yeah, del yeah. c over w i j i don't even know <laughs> <laughs> so many subscripts okay that is what we're looking for yeah so basically we're like going through the network and we're saying like for every weight fix all the other weights pretend they don't change at all mm -hmm. and then see which direction is going to um, descend the most when we adjust this, when this weight is able to change. Yeah, and, and then we do that for every single one. Kind of surprising how that actually leads to optimization, right? Because you're almost like ignoring everything else. So isn't it possible that going in all these directions at the same time is going to wind up in the worst case because, you know, we're kind of like, go, we're kinda, what, if, what if we like go in this direction and hit a wall in another dimension though? And, and then, then it's like, a worse position to be in. So like, why don't we do it iteratively? Why don't we like adjust every single dimension one at a time? Why is it we do it all, all at the same time? Uh, because computationally we can do this overwhelmingly fast. Yeah, because in large networks you have you know a million parameters, so it's hard to adjust a million parameters all one at a time. And this, um, if you take small enough steps, it, you, you pretty reliably actually do decrease cost. Sometimes, of course, you actually do increase cost with um, overtraining, maybe. Like well, no, you can just straight up increase cost. So it's possible to increase costs even if you take the take yeah. the gradient. So the thing is, what we usually do is uh, we train on not just one, if, uh, not just one example. We train on a batch of examples, maybe mm -hmm. like let's say thirty-two yeah. examples or something. Stochastic gradient. So yeah, yeah, and what it means is a kind of it means that the loss landscape isn't exactly the same every every step you take. Mm -hmm. So. It's a little fuzzy. Yeah. No, but so for one example, like yeah, let's yeah, say two, let's you're always two. meant like lowering the cost. Depending on your step size, you should. you should usually be lowering. So I can imagine a shape in three dimensions where this is isn't really true. I think. I mean, yeah. If it's just a it's like kind of like this. You can make counter examples. You don't always decrease costs. So okay, but. But I guess this answers my question then, because I would imagine that you could just iteratively go over every single weight and take the derivative along from every single weight and then update those and then take the next derivative, update that weight, next derivative, so on and so forth, 
and you never never like increase cost, right? Well, the problem with that is just it's too computationally heavy. Like okay. if you have a million parameters, you can't individually go to each a million. That that's going to be take a million times more long. Uh, okay, because taking derivatives is really hard. Okay. Can I can I say something though? Um, you can actually a uh, nice thing about multivariable calculus is like in this sense at least, you can kind of treat the variables pretty independently. Like, say um, in x going this way is going to decrease my cost, but in y, it's another axis. It's not affecting x. You go this way, right? So if you take those two vectors, or two, those two direct, like, take those two numbers and turn them into a direction vector, you will decrease the cost. Now, the thing with like it doesn't always uh, decrease the cost. I, there has to be something funky going on there because the math doesn't let that happen. No, like if it's a single example, I'm pretty sure it should always decrease the cost. Yeah. Um, no, because really? Well, just, theoretically, just just I mean, imagine so. you just take like a huge learning rate, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. You can just yeah. wind up somewhere. Oh, no, that, that, that's yeah. true. That's well, true. Well, you can imagine yeah. a shape where that's not true. That's true. With it, well, with it, like with it, with it, yeah, yeah. You know, actually, I'll definitely get it. You can take the limit as learning rate goes zero, you always get it. That's the definition of a gradient. Yeah, it's gradient. Because we don't have an infinitely small learning rate, then there's a chance loss can be increased. Okay, so the answer is like, Theoretically, like if you're just doing the math, you're always well, get rid of the learning rate, mm -hmm. like, yeah. and then you're always decreasing the cost. Yeah. But to well, ensure that you'd move moving yeah. infinitesimally small step forward. Yeah, you could definitely yeah. hear an example where it wouldn't work because you'd have some really weird boundaries where suddenly it skyrockets off to nowhere. And yeah. then that that exact well, I mean, point. I think <laughs> I don't know if other people have done this, but I do this all the time where I am messing around with the learning rate. I make it too big and <laughs> just oh. basically <laughs> it goes this yeah. way. I'll yeah, yeah, no, the gradient just blows. Yeah, it, it starts it happens. <laughs> down here and then it overshoots the minimum and then it overshoots it again and then again and then again and then, again, and then, again, and then it's <laughs> off into nowhere. Yeah, that's, uh, that happens. Uh, that's I've that's seen all I'm that saying. Sure. Yeah. Well, I want to put a learning rate in there for people that know what it does, but like that's it's pretty finicky variable. Um, I don't know what you usually set it to. In my example, it's like 0.1. Yeah, um, so I think, yeah. yeah. Typically, yeah, that's especially like uh, a problem in like well, strictly statistic gradient descent. A lot of the like more fancier optimization methods. Uh, don't suffer from uh, like gradient. I use the adaptive learning rate. Like I think Adam or like one yeah, Adam is a Adam is a pretty learning. standard one that just kind of adapts the learning rate as it goes. Yeah. You're recommended to just mm -hmm. use it as provided in whatever implementation and not worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So now let's actually get into this because right now to change w super i sub l, we need to calculate the partial derivative with respect to w super i sub l in terms of the cost. So uh, I know I was talking about vectors for a bit, focusing on that one number and that one weight, because it'll help us a lot. Because otherwise, when you get into vectors, it's like, oh, you got to do this, and you got to do an outer product, cross product. I don't want to go into that. So we are just trying to find this number. And this is a number, by the way. The, I know I'm writing a bunch of abstract symbols, but these ultimately turn to be numbers. So we're trying to find this number. And this is where the geniuses of like the 70s or whatever like pulled this out of their <laughs> um, but essentially, if we have this right here, we can actually split it into three separate partial derivatives that are calculatable. Here's the first one. It would be del C over del A O L times del A O L. I hope you guys know what I mean by A O L. I'm just. <laughs> you mean the old search? <laughs> del Z L over del W super I sub L. Those cross out. I know that they don't actually like cross out, but due to the chain rule, you can, if you multiply these three together, you get this. And just notice that like that's there, and that's there. Now, what is Z? I think I kind of mentioned it briefly over there. Z is the raw activation. Separating it helps us a lot for the computation, trust me. Uh, I don't know how you do it without it. It would just be a bit more funky. Okay. To be clear, this is not the axis, Z, right? This is not the Z no, axis. No, no, no. Sorry. My bad. I should clarify that. There's yeah. raw activation. Yeah, there is no Z in the like, uh, function. There you go. Oh, my hair is. Wait, what do you mean by raw activation? Um, before we plug it into sigmoid. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's just, oh, okay. So, okay. Yeah. so just the value of. Yeah, the value of the neuron ends up containing sort of, and then you throw it into the uh, you throw it into the 
activation function, and that becomes what you use for the next neuron. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, or in the case of Z, it's well, if it did you specify that Z is specifically the last one, or just some? Oh no 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 sorry. Just in this case, Z is raw activation. I'm just using some Z neuron. Or specifically, we are going to be using. We're calculating this, and we're going to be operating in like this space right here. Okay. Just consider this for now. Um, and then Z would be the raw activation of this neuron. Okay. So there you go. Well, all right, now let's take the nice, long, slow, painful, arduous process of calculating each one of these separately. It's not actually that bad. But before we calculate these, I have to define the equations by which we can calculate these. First is cost is equal to AOL minus Y hat squared. Pretty simple. That is the cost function. Okay? The second one is going to be, yeah, what is AOL? AOL is equal to sigmoid of Z sub L. Make sense so far? Because that goes into that. And finally, you have what is Z sub L? Uh, this is where the index chasing kind of gets, kind of catches up to me. Um, you have A super I sub L minus one times W super I L plus a super 2i l minus 1 times w2i sub l. What does that mean? Essentially, it means that the raw activation is the sum of this times this plus this times this. That's it. That's what it means. Hmm. OK, that's, that's cool. Okay. I just don't know why you had to take the derivative to figure that out. What do you mean? mean? Yeah, not taking the derivative yet. I'm not taking the derivative yet. Just the values. These are equations. Oh, pure. Well, what's the derivative of the there then? Of the, okay, so this is what we're trying to find. This is what we split it into to find it. Like oh, I said. Oh, oh, yeah. okay, I see. And then these are the equations we need to actually find these. Now, notice something. I have the C here. If I cover that up, right, and I use this del over del A O L, and then take that on both sides, I will get del C over del A L A O L. And this one right here, right? If I cover that up and oh. then do like. So I'll do like, I'll actually, I have to write it separately. I think I wrote that a bit too big. But what we can do with these, you know, here, I'm going to take them derivative one by one. This is where the actual math comes in. And I felt so cool when I did this the first time. <laughs> del a uh, del a o l c equals del over del a o l of a o l minus y hat squared. And this side would just turn out to be del C over del A O L. And before anyone says anything, I know I said partials, you treat that as a constant. So you might think this equals zero, because you're taking the partial derivative of a constant, and that number is not in here. But technically, this is not treated as a constant for the case of the partial derivative, because it's actually a function that includes this. That makes sense. Otherwise, you would get zero equals x in a lot of partial derivative cases. For people that have taken Calc 3, back me up on this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Just that was a very hesitant <laughs> um, <laughs> no, Just, just I was replace it for a second, sorry. Oh, well, I was just saying, like, I know I said for partial derivatives, you treat everything else except what you're taking it with respect to as a constant. But if you're taking it, like, for example, z in that case, or like c in this case, which is the actual function, it turns into this, okay. not zero. Because yeah. this is in terms of that, that we, which we're taking the respect to. So you can't just remove it. Yeah, that's reasonable. Yeah. So, so if someone actually would like to take the room of that respect to well. like one or like one two a is that it mm, uh, close close so the two, if you expand it out you get the two a oh right. two a yeah. and, then, is and then <laughs> chain rule you take the derivative of this and the inside that turns out to be one yeah so that is the first derivative we've calculated that's that one right there so we got that Next one, del of del, see, I literally just turned this into another machine learning class. I'm so sorry. You guys are the four of these now. <laughs> it's, it's, it's okay. Yeah. Why um, do you think I said that for three machine learning yeah. classes? <laughs> you like this stuff. Um, del, um, del z l of sigmoid z l. Now, funnily enough, um, this doesn't turn out to be as bad because like, oh, sigmoid, 
scary a fraction with the derivative over there, right? But um, I'll just write this here so you guys can reference it. Make sense? Just in general, that's, that's the derivative. Mm. Where'd I get that from? Me too. I'm not calculating that by hand, I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, so essentially what that lets us do is a couple things. I'm gonna simplify this a bit further, just so, no. Um, also, is that camera? Yeah, I can see me. Okay, so del A O L over del Z sub L equals sigmoid of, because we're taking the derivative, so it's technically sigmoid prime of Z sub L, but I'm gonna expand sigmoid prime into sigmoid prime dx. It's also that. I'm going to expand it into just what it was in sigmoid terms, and then you'll see why I do that in a second. Uh, so basically, what that's saying is like, hey, if you take the partial derivative with respect to ZL, and since ZL is the only thing in that, you can just take it normally like I did here. It's almost like it's not even a partial derivative at that point. You don't need to ignore anything else. And then you get this, and notice that earlier I defined A O of L is sigmoid Z of L. So we get this kind of like almost nested in itself kind of deal. A O L Z L is equal to A O L times one minus A O L. That is derivative number two. Now let me step through that again because that might have been a bit confusing. Take the partial derivative with respect to z sub l on the left side, take it on the right side, and I would have written just sigmoid prime because that is valid to write. Think of sigmoid as just f of z sub l, and you take the derivative of f sub z of l, you get f prime of z sub of l, right? But um, this actually sigmoid prime turns out to be able to be written in terms of sigmoid itself without actually having to do any fancy ch e chasing over there. So I just write it as this, sigmoid times in parentheses, one minus sigmoid. And then we know that sigmoid of z sub l is equal to the activation. So I can write it in terms of the activation. Kind of interesting. So that's where we get the second derivative from, okay? And the third and final one, we're almost done by the way, guys, <laughs> is going to be written as del of Sorry, what are you saying, James? Sum of the activations. Sum of is it, does it end up being the sum of the activations? This right here? Uh, no. The one to the right. Sorry. Very, 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 no, 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 I see what you're saying. Sorry, I was kind of lost for a second. Very close. Yeah. Take this of z sub l. And when I write it out, maybe you'll be able to get it. Um, of Someone want to take the partial derivative of that? I don't really want to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, a helpful <laughs> way to think about this is actually, someone want to do it before I start talking again? Well, it should be just uh, A, I, L minus one. Correct. Because this we can just straight up ignore does not concern us because it is an addition and a derivative and it doesn't include terms that we care about whatsoever. And a nice way to put this would be, imagine this as x, this as four, derivative of four x is four. Four is represented by this, therefore you just have a i l minus one. That is the third derivative. And now, multiplying this all together, you get that del c over del w super i sub l is equal to 2 a o l minus y hat times 
AOL times 1 minus AOL times AIL minus 1. This is going to be del C over del AOL. This is del AOL over, oh, sorry. Del ZL, and this is going to be del ZL over del W super I sub L. That number right there. Notice how every single variable in that we can find by looking at this space alone. You just need to know something about the neuron, some, something about the neuron before it, and the weights connecting them. That's it. There's not a single variable in there that requires you to reach more back more than one layer. So nice, because you can apply this cursively. Now, does that, by the way, this is like the, the thing I've been working up towards this whole time. This equation right here. If you get this number by plugging in these values from that untrained network, this value that you get, if you apply that using this, subtracting it times the learning rate from W pre, you will get a weight that will increase, or sorry, decrease the cost. That, that equation right there. I mean, I didn't understand where. Yeah, actually, can you? I didn't understand where this came from. Okay, that's but the thing. That's what I'm saying. That if was you like, want me to just accept it, I will. Okay, um, I guess I can actually somewhat explain it. So the reason that it's possible is a chain rule. The reason I did it is to make it more understandable. And the truth is, these are all written in terms of each other. Notice I could plug sigmoid z of l into here, mm -hmm. and then I could have plugged this into sigmoid z of l. Mm. But that would make taking the partial derivative a lot more complicated. Uh -oh. Because it'd be a bunch of nested functions. Can I have that for a yeah. yeah. So strictly speaking, what you could do on a network of this scale is you could actually take the entirety of the network and turn it into one single large algebraic well, expression <laughs> of literally just the oh. entirety of the network written yeah. out as one formula. Mm -hmm. That's just a mathematical formula. You could just straight up plug that into Wolfram Alpha, say, give me the <laughs> partial derivative of this so like with respect to this. Mm -hmm. You could even like plug that into the cost function. You could just make this all one big math expression. You could do this by hand. Yeah, you, you could. I wouldn't recommend it, <laughs> but you could. <laughs> but uh, this is just a way of sort of formalizing it in a way that is generalizable beyond just any particular weight, any particular weight there. We could just do this for all the weights anywhere. Yeah, and there is a one more step we have to do, um, and I'll explain why in a second, but this is like the big, I'll actually just box it. The, the classic calculus set it to zero and <laughs> is it? No, 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 no. That number, because this is going to be a number, mm -hmm. that number, if you subtract from the pre weight, you're going to get a post weight. But you haven't minimized it. You have to set it to zero and then, like. No, 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 because the minimization in here is different than normal minimization. Because remember, like I said, a gradient, the gradient is composed of a vector of all of these, except yeah. you would take them with respect to a different variable every single time. It'd be a vector cons uh, of, of a ton of these, it'd be a vector of a ton of those. They're just numbers at the end of the day. But then you would apply that to that equation I wrote here because uh, in multivariable, the gradient would give you the steepest descent up. So you just flip that on its side and go backwards. Um, what you're saying is usually the classic uh, calculus problem where you find the absolute, or you, you find the local minimum by setting the derivative to zero. Uh, unfortunately, neural networks are usually too complicated to actually set it to zero and then solve for an answer. So you have to do this process, and you have to take a lot of steps down to just try and find a zero. Yeah. Because um, you can't solve for one because it's too complicated. For for this one in particular, you might be able to, like for something of a, a small scale like this, it might be possible. Actually, okay. for, uh, for top like last for linear, sure. uh, like if you had no activation function, there's something called the least.